the splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice, he wraps himself in light, and dark My name's Alison, I'd like to welcome you this morning. And this morning, as you may or may not be aware, is Palm Sunday. I'd just like to start the service with a few verses. So the next day, the huge crowd that arrived for the feast heard that Jesus was entering Jerusalem. And they broke off palm branches and went out to meet him. And they cheered, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in God's name. Yes, the King of Israel. And Jesus got a young donkey and he rode it, just as the scriptures had said. No fear, daughter Zion. See how your king comes riding a donkey's colt. And Lord, we thank you for Palm Sunday where Roman emperors would ride their finest stallions into a conquered city, where presidents today travel in vast armoured cavalcades. You, Lord Jesus, you sat humbly on a donkey. And Lord, may our praise and worship join with those who waved palm branches as we praise you, Jesus, our Saviour. Let's worship. At your name, the mountains shake and crumble. At your name, Angels will bow, the earth will rejoice. 
time for the family song so could I welcome everyone kids adults whoever up the front to the family song and we've got Isla and Rebecca that are doing this morning so thank you so much for doing the, the actions for us when we can worship together. Um, for the next piece, I am putting on my church warden hat and want to let you know about something that's coming up over the summer. So uh, for those who are aware about the formalities of the Church of England, um, there's a process in place called uh, a sabbatical process whereby vicars get a chance every 10 years to step away, to retreat, to pause, to rest, to seek God, um, and as Chris knows, this is something that we've, um, as a PCC, kind of been talking about and had a conversation with uh, Chris about over the last little while. Um, and uh, I think really it was always something, Chris, wasn't it, that was going to happen before you took over as vicar, but then the timelines for that didn't really work. So um, as church wardens, Emma Buck and myself have been encouraging you to think about when you might uh, take your sabbatical. And I know Bishop Lusa as well is, is very much wanting to ensure that, that Chris has time to, to rest and uh, to prepare for the next uh, 10 years. So I'm now letting you know today that um, from end of May to end of August, Chris is uh, going to be on sabbatical. 
and, uh, and it's an opportunity this morning for Chris to share a little bit about uh, what, that, what that means for him, but also just to let you know, you know, we've got an amazing staff team. We've got uh, a fantastic leadership team who are really, um, you know, really able and supportive, and, and also we've got the support of... Um, Stu and Sam as well. So everything is very much in capable hands, uh, but we just wanted to kind of highlight and let everybody know. Chris. Yeah, this feels strange. Someone stood next to you talking about you. I always kind of find that a bit weird. So um, this conversation began quite a number of years ago uh, when Mark, uh, Lindsay and myself, Mark and Lindsay Melios, she used to be the senior leaders here, uh, about the, the kind of possibility of me sort of becoming um, the lead pastor here. And the kind of plan would always be that I take a sabbatical beforehand, three months to retreat, to pray, to prepare myself. And that wasn't able to happen um, for COVID and, and all that happened with my wife, Nell. So um, uh, when I did take over, the bishop um, made extra space for that to happen. The head of ministry asked me to do that. Um, just to kind of talk you through some of the practicalities, because you might think, well, hang on, if you're not here, who's in charge? Who's doing what? Um, and, and basically, like, no, guys, it's a free-for-all. Do what you like. No, it's not. It's not. Um, we've got, one of the things I, you know, if I'm not available on a Monday for whatever reason, we have a staff meeting on a Monday and, and there isn't an obvious person to take over the staff meeting because all of them could do it. We've got this amazingly competent team of people uh, on our staff who, um, uh, so just in terms of how it's going to work, so our Sunday services, we've got amazing preachers, leaders, people uh, within St Paul's and on the staff team, but not most of the preachers and teachers and leaders, and I counted up, I think it was 16 yesterday, uh, of people who can preach uh, at St Paul's and have done recently. Um, who can do that. So we're in really capable hands with Sundays. Um, in terms of sort of like, what about pastoral stuff? What about our contact with the staff? So um, Karen Kosh, who is not just the children's pastor, she does, children's work is one of the most important things we do at St Paul's, but she does loads around that. She's going to sort of run a bit of a point role within the staff team, but alongside others, it's not just going to be about her. Um, Alison and, and Emma Buck, who are our church wardens, are going to be at our staff meetings regularly, so they're going to be kind of making sure things are going well. If something happens, uh, there's an emergency or, or something kind of needs to be, needs my attention, as it were, um, then that will come through Alison and Emma. And if I need to come back and do some bits, then that's absolutely fine. I won't be able to go and travel and do other things. I've got Lily at home. She's finishing year six, going into year seven. Um, and so I'll be doing the school run. She'll be coming to St Paul's here um, and I'll be doing some other, other stuff at that time. So a couple of things I've booked in. I've got a silent retreat book for five days, which I will eat. Yeah, I know exactly. <laughs> which may be the end of my sabbatical. I may go completely mad. And I've got that booked in quite early. That I just may go mad after five days. But <coughs> um, that's a guided thing. I've got um, some other stuff, uh, people I'm spending time with, my spiritual director I'll be seeing most weeks. Um, um, I'll be taking the time to rest, because if I'm honest, the past three to four years have been exhausting uh, in every way. And I'm not about to keel over now. I'm not about to run away. I've not said I'm giving up and they're trying to keep me. It's nothing like that. This has been planned for quite a long time. Um, and in fact, they, the bishop wanted me to take some more time off. And I said, well, I, I think I probably just, one lot will be fine thinking I could take like ages I could fish for weeks it'd be brilliant um, but um, all of that's been planned and put together in place so if you've got any questions I'm really happy for you to ask me I know this might be a bit of a surprise to some I know some of you will know because you're part of the PCC or standing committee or the staff team but um, you know I'm really really grateful that I'm able to have this time and for Lily as well in that particular transition from year six to year seven um, but I'll be back at the end of August, um, ready and raring to go. Thank you. Thank Is that you all right? That. Fantastic. And yeah, just to say that if anyone's got any questions, obviously speak to Chris, but also Emma and myself are around. If you want to understand a bit more how it's all going to work, um, why don't I pray for our children before they go to their groups? Father, we thank you for every child and young person here. We thank you for every group meeting in every part of this building and across the road, Lord. And Lord, we pray that this morning they would learn more about you. 
Learn who you are and how loved they are by you, Lord. Amen. And those of us staying, let's uh, worship as the children go out. Everyone needs compassion, but that's never failed. because we trust and we hope in your constant love and your almighty power. Thank you, Lord, that you are Saviour and King. And Heavenly Father, you, you are great. You're an almighty God. We thank you, you are a God of faithfulness, a God of love, that you call us back to you when we wander, that you love us simply because we are yours. Lord, in our world of uncertainty and instability, we thank you that you are constant, you are unchanging in a world full of violent struggles. We thank you that you are love in the chaos of society and the fragility of relationships. We thank you that you are a loving God. You bring order, you are always faithful and true. Lord, we so need your presence. We ask for your presence now. Lord, we will be coming this morning to you with many different perspectives, each holding different people, different places in our world close to our hearts, each with different worries, cares, different joys. We want to especially come to you now with our prayers for areas of conflict. Lord, protect the innocent from danger. Be with those who are worried for or who have lost loved ones. Cover these areas with a powerful movement of your spirit of justice. 
Lord, we want to also pray for areas where there are people who are persecuted just for following you. We pray that you would protect them from physical harm. You'd strengthen them as they hold tightly to your promises. We pray for those in Africa, in the Middle East, in Asia. Lord, give your people in these places a special wisdom, a humility, and an overwhelming sense of your presence. And Lord, we pray that you would send a powerful movement of your spirit there to bring love across these nations. Lord, some of us will be praising you for blessings this week. Others will be leaning on you for strength in difficult circumstances. Some praying for healing for themselves, for those they love. Others might just feel as though they're, the pressures of life are just pushing you out. Lord, wherever we find ourselves, bring that cry of Hosanna to our hearts. Fill us with a dependency on you and your promises, a deep sense of trust in your desire to bring good things to us. And remind us, Lord, each day how much you did to show your love and care for each one of us. And we pray these things now in the name of our King, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And we declare that we will praise and exalt you because you are faithful and your love endures forever. Amen. So if you've uh, arrived uh, since the service started, I'd like to welcome you. My name's Alison and... I'm Tamlin, and it's great to see you here this morning. We just want to tell you a few things that are happening in the life of the church coming up. So, firstly. So, you may have noticed, or you may not have noticed, I didn't, but it, I guess it depends which way you arrive at church. But the scaffolding has started coming up on the side, this side of the building uh, in preparation for our solar panels, which is very exciting. Woo! Um, the PCC will know how long we have been uh, uh, working to, to sort this out and we're very excited. But in case you're just wondering, we just thought we'd let you know why the scaffolding is up. Great. So, happening tonight, we have our next New Rhine celebration and we have Becky and Paul Harcourt coming to talk to us tonight. They are the national um, leaders of New Wine. They're busy handing over their leadership, but they lead a church... Um, in East London, I think, Woodford Wells, and they are incredible communicators and teachers. So I really encourage you to come along tonight. It's going to be a really, really good service. And then starting this week, we have our holiday club, which is really exciting. First of all, thank you to all the volunteers who are helping it to happen. We really appreciate you. And we'd love for you to pray for us as a church family, and um, particularly for this week and all the kids that are coming into this church building that are really get to know Jesus and that they will really seek after him. The one thing that um, the team is still looking for is some people to provide some refreshments. So every day we'd like to give something to the team um, during the day and after holiday club. So if you're able to bring a plate of eats or snacks, um, we'd really appreciate it, either something sweet or savory. So if you are able to do that, please do chat to Rebecca or Karen and they would love to hear from you. And uh, Palm Sunday today, so we are going into Holy Week, and we've got uh, lots of opportunities to meet together and worship together as we remember the events leading up to Good Friday and Easter Sunday. So firstly, on Maundy Thursday, we have uh, a very simple communion service uh, that Tim is leading us with, so that is this Thursday eight o'clock. Then Friday, there are three opportunities to remember the events of Good Friday. So firstly, in the morning, we're going to be doing our walk of witness. Um, and previous years, we've maybe kind of gathered at different places on the way to um, Christ the Saviour in Ealing Broadway. But this year, as a church family, we are gathering here nine... 9.9.15 for hot cross buns and then we'll all be able to leave together and uh, at 9.30 to walk up to Christ the Saviour. And it's, it's a wonderful opportunity to gather with other churches um, across the whole of Ealing. And I just think it really it is, as it says, a, a walk of witness. I think it really kind of shines out to the community 
that it's Good Friday and it causes people perhaps to stop and wonder and stop and, and think. So, uh, so that's Good Friday morning. Then, uh, 12 o'clock, we have here in church a silent service. So this is very much a time of reflection. It's going to be a led service with readings and responses, but this will be 45 minutes of silence. So this is um, 12 to 12.45. And then there'll be more hot cross buns if you didn't uh, fill up uh, with them earlier and you want a chance for more hot cross buns, 12.45 for hot cross buns. And then at one o'clock, we have a worship together service here. Um, So that's for the whole church family to come to, to again, remember the events of Good Friday. And then Easter Sunday, we are all here for worship together at 9.15 or 11. And then in the evening, we've got a very special baptism service. So, um, so, so many opportunities to come and um, celebrate Easter as a church family. Sounds great. And if you haven't bought your Easter eggs yet, we are selling some. And... Um, these are called the real Easter egg, and what it is, is a chocolate made of fair trade chocolate, but then it's also got a little book about the Easter story. So giving one of these is great because you get chocolate and the Easter story. So we, I think we only have four left that we're selling at the back. They're £4.50, so please do um, get one afterwards if you're interested in that. And then the last thing I'm going to do is we're going to read um, Bands of Marriage. Are oh, Siren down here? There you are. <laughs> So, I want to publish the bands of marriage between Daniel Edward Govatsky and Susan Barbara George of the parish of St. Mary's Ealing and on the electoral roll of St. Paul's Church Ealing. This is the first time of asking. If anyone knows any reason why this couple should not marry, then they are to declare it now. Okay, we'd love to pray for you. So, Lord, we just thank you so much for Dan and Sue, and we just pray your real blessing over them as they lead up to getting married. Lord, we thank you that marriage is such a gift from you. So Lord, we just pray that they'll know your spirit with them as they journey up and lead up to this wedding day. Amen. Wonderful. And now I'm going to have, Belle's going to come and read for us. Oh, yeah. This morning's reading is from John chapter 11. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and his sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was, and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, 
He was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But several of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of a blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there for four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, thank you for this week as we begin that journey to the cross and through to the resurrection. Lord, lead us this week into Jerusalem. Help us to listen in on what you're saying. Lord, once again, help us to see with fresh eyes the events of this week and the eternal significance that they have. And above all else, help us to keep our eyes fixed upon Jesus. And we pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Um, I have to say, this week for me is the best and most important week of the year. If I'm honest, Christmas has nothing on this week. Now, I can say this now, the children aren't here. But for me... It just nothing compares with the, the, the amazing and wonderful journey that we go on this week uh, to Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday. It's such an important week. I, I, I can't emphasize it enough for us. If you're here as a Christian, you've been a Christian for forever, this is the week. If you, um, as it were, wouldn't necessarily call yourself a Christian or be religious and that, this, this is the week. Just stay with me for these next few minutes. Um, we followed Jesus into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Um, and, and even on Palm Sunday, we give out palm crosses. Now, they would not have laid down palm crosses. They would have just put palm branches down. But we know where this story's going. We know what's to come. Um, and, and as we follow Jesus into Jerusalem, we're, we see the crowds crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the Messiah. This is the king who's coming. They would have known their Old Testament. The, the king on the donkey from, um, uh, from Zechariah 9, you know, he's a point, he's, he's pointing to this, this, this Messiah to come who's going to save um, his people. And then as we stay with Jesus in the temple in Jerusalem, we, we feel the tension rising. As Jesus is having those conversations and confrontations with the religious leaders, um, and, and, and we journey through that, and then we see Jesus having that last supper with his friends, um, and the betrayal of Jesus by Judas, and, and the trial, the arrest of Jesus in the garden, and the trial of Jesus, and then we come to the crucifixion of Jesus, and then we come to the silence of the Saturday, where everything seems to have stopped but it hasn't. And on that Sunday morning, the stone is rolled away and he is risen and Jesus is alive. And as Pope John Paul II said, that we are the Easter people and hallelujah is our song. That is a sentence to live by. We are the Easter people and hallelujah is our song. And I don't know about you, do you have a favorite like show or play or film that you watch that's got that 
element of tension. You know, there's tragedy or there's you know, just, you know, is it going to be okay? The first time you watch it, you're literally kind of gripping the seat. I don't know if it's all going to be all right, but then it is, and it's brilliant at the end. And you know when you go back and watch that movie, you still feel that sense of excitement, but maybe not the tension. Then you've got a little smile on your face, even when there's that difficult moment, betrayal or tragedy, because you know what's coming at the end. And for us, that's what this week is like. We can't pretend that the resurrection hasn't happened. We can't pretend that Jesus has died on the cross for our sins. So we, the whole week, way the week through, we kind of got a smile on our face. See, I know where this is going. Even at Good Friday, that day where we're somber, where we, we look at the cross, we remind ourselves of that day, we've still got a bit of a smile on our face because we know what's coming. As Tony Campolo said, Friday's here, but Sunday's coming. Um, and even on that day, Easter Saturday, where everything is silent, and it, in the story appears as though death has won, we can smile because we know it hasn't. We know what's coming. That's why this week is so wonderful. That's why we can journey through the week with Jesus, knowing that he's headed to the cross. That's why we give out these palm crosses. He's headed to the cross, but the cross isn't his final destination. He's headed for the resurrection. And, and so, I love this passage. I get very excited about it, as you can tell. But you know, this week is the week where we just tune in once again. Whatever our year's been, however life is, this week gives us an amazing opportunity to tune in and journey with Jesus. And, and this sign, this is a little bit of my guesswork, but I'm fairly sure John is intending us to see this sign that's taking place just a few weeks before what we would call Holy Week, what the Jews were looking forward to as Passover. Um, and um, they, Jesus is on his way into Jerusalem. He's at Bethany, which is really close. It's only a couple of miles away. Um, excuse me. Um, he's uh, at Bethany. Um, and um, this is the final sign. It's only chapter 11 of John's Gospel. There are 21 chapters in John's Gospel. So it's literally halfway through. But this is the final of the seven signs. You think, like, I got there a bit quick. It's like, as the film ended, is this, is this the kind of final thing? Um, and it's not, but the next 11 chapters build up to the eighth sign, the resurrection. This seventh sign is really significant. It's also the only sign in John's Gospel. There are seven signs. We're looking, we've been looking through them in, uh, uh, on Sundays in Lent. There are also seven sayings in John's Gospel, seven sayings that Jesus announces about himself. I am um, the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. I am uh, the shepherd of the sheep. I am the gate. I am the true vine. I've probably forgotten a couple of the others, but um, well, I have honestly. And this is the only one where the sign and the saying are together. So that's why this is such a significant and important story. So if you've got your Bibles, do open John chapter 11. We're going to journey through and just look again, retell the story, and just try and spot a few things that John and Jesus are trying to teach us. <coughs> Sorry. Apparently the cough gets worse when I talk, but I won't shut up, so that's, you know, so my daughter says anyway. So let's look at the story. So right at the beginning, now a man from, named Lazarus was ill. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. So if you're familiar with the gospel stories, in Luke's gospel, not in John's gospel, we meet Mary and Martha. Um, Mary and Martha open their home to Jesus, and you know we've, you know, Alison spoke recently on this uh, this passage in, uh, in Luke chapter ten, where Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about many things, and then all of us are thinking, yeah, but if we don't have any Marthas, we don't get anything done. And Mary's the one sat at the feet of Jesus; she's done the right thing, and it's that Mary and Martha. We'll look at them a little bit later on. And Lazarus is their brother, uh, and 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 is described as the one you love. In other words, Lazarus and Jesus were very close. Jesus says this uh, when he heard that Lazarus was ill. This illness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. It's interesting. Most of the time in life, we don't get the answer to the why question. Why has that happened? 
Well, this time, Jesus front and center says, this is why. I want to say this answer to that question, why, is for this story. It doesn't necessarily answer every question, why. Um, I think that this is a really important and specific thing. We, we can't necessarily say, well, this is for that as well. This is for this. Jesus answered the why question. What's the why question? Well, why is Lazarus ill? Why is he dying? And why haven't you come? I mean, they're kind of fairly common questions that we might ask, right? And Jesus says, well, this is for the glory of God. This is so that you'll believe. There's a purpose to this. There's a, a why that I'm going to explain to you and you're going to see. Um, and then there's this lovely little bit uh, later on in, in, in John 18, John, uh, John 11, sorry, um, when now it's time to go to Lazarus. Now, Lazarus is dead by this point, um, and Jesus had stayed two more days where he was. So there's, there's a time period. There's lots that's happened in that time. Lazarus has been buried. He's been put into the, into the tomb, and Jesus is days late for that event. And then he says this in verse 11, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep and I'm going to wake him up. Just love that kind of, it's almost as if Jesus is like, off we go. And the disciples are a bit like, what do you mean he's asleep? Surely, the next verse is brilliant. Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. The disciples, Jesus must be like, oh my days. You know, it's a, it's a metaphor, friends. We, we, you know, we're not talking literally. And then he says, I love this, John says, so then he told them plainly, in other words, it's like, for goodness sake, Lazarus is dead. Let's be clear on this. He's not asleep. He's dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe. Again, more of the why. Why is Jesus not there? So let's go to him. Off they go, having had a discussion about whether it's safe or not and all that sort of thing. Um, they arrive at Bethany and then Jesus meets with Mary, Martha and then Mary. Um, now, Martha, in the story of Mary and Martha, we often think, well, she's the busy one. She's the one that's focused on the practical stuff. You know, we wouldn't necessarily think of her as the faith one. Mary's the faith one. She sat at the feet of Jesus. And if we think that, we couldn't be more wrong. We couldn't be more wrong. Martha is very honest. <coughs> she's very honest. Uh, Martha is um, full of faith. Lord, she says to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Isn't that a question that we all ask? If, if you'd just been here, Jesus, we'd have all, it'd all be all right. If you'd have just turned up when we asked you to, it would all be all right. I don't know about you, but that question, reson- that, that, that statement really resonates with me. And Jesus just says, well, your brother's going to rise. That this isn't the end, Martha. And Martha just demonstrates this incredible faith, absolutely incredible faith. She says, I know he will rise again at the resurrection on the last day. She's already got this in her mind. What a wonderful woman of faith. And then Jesus announces to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die Do you believe this? Now remember why John wrote this gospel. This is such an important question. John said this, this is these things have been written in John chapter 21, that you, the readers, would believe that Jesus is the Christ or the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you will have life in his name. Martha's response, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. It's like she gives the answer that John is looking for. Martha, for us, is the example of what it means to believe, of faith. Bear in mind, Lazarus is dead. He's in the tomb. She does not know what's coming. But this is my faith. In the hardest, darkest of moments, my brother has died, but I hold to you and to your words, Jesus, And I believe that what you say you'll do, you'll do. And I trust you in this moment. What profound faith. I think in John's gospel, there are two, there are lots of moments of faith, but there are two people particularly that that seem to have this amazing response. The first is Martha, and the second is Thomas. Thomas, who we know as Doubting Thomas, which is 
grossly unfair on poor Thomas. He's just simply the one who asks the obvious question. I mean, you're all believing because you've seen him. I haven't seen him yet. So when I've seen him and touched his wounds, fair enough. I don't think that's doubt. I think that's just rational, honest thinking. But that doesn't really kind of, you know, rational, honest thinking, Thomas, doesn't really kind of have the same ring to it as doubting Thomas. Just make it a plea for Thomas right there. But these two, so you've got the doubter and the woman. I mean, pardon me being blunt. You know, the doubter and the woman, these are the two people in John's gospel neither of whom are the best like witnesses if you were kind of you know in a show a trial and you were putting someone up you wouldn't put the doubter and the the woman you'd put two respectable religious leaders and that sort of thing and john's like i don't care martha's statement of faith is profound thomas's declaration of faith is profound because they've seen jesus they believe in him they trust him um, and this is the kind of faith that john wants to proclaim and wants to point us to Martha, what a woman. And then Jesus spends time with Mary. Now, Martha greets Jesus at the home, because that's what she does. She's the head of the house, as it were. Where's Mary? Mary is, all, Mary is headed to the tomb. And Jesus kind of seems to beat her there, gets to the tomb before Mary arrives, and, and he's already at the tomb. And, and this is profound here. You know, Martha's faith, Mary has deep faith as well. Um, and when Mary, again, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, just as Martha said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. There's something common to the human condition when it comes to suffering. is if only God would fix it. If only God would do it. If Jesus, if only you'd been there, it would have made it all different. And, and I, I, I've asked that question plenty of times. God, why didn't you answer our prayers? Haven't we all asked those questions, wondered that? We're probably in the midst, midst, of it for some, midst of it for some of us. God, why won't you answer this prayer? And Jesus, again, doesn't sort of answer Mary's question here. Um, it just says this. He saw Mary weeping and the Jews who had come along with her, those who were companions to her, who were weeping with her, um, and he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Now, I can't quite remember the Greek word for this, but it basically means he was moved in the bowels. It's like the deepest part of who we are. Jesus is moved. It's not like he shed the kind of like obligatory tear. He, he looked emotional. He is moved from the deepest part of who he is. And it says it twice. That's how, that's how important John says this is. Jesus, in verse 38, Jesus once more deeply moved. It's like wave after wave. Jesus feels the grief that Mary feels. Jesus feels the sadness that Mary feels. But Jesus knows he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Bear that in mind. And so why does Jesus weep? They think he's weeping because he's lost Lazarus. He's not. He's weeping because... We have a God who weeps with those who weep. We have a God who grieves with those who grieve. Where, where do we find God in our suffering? Well, we find him at the tomb with us. We find him at the bedside with us. We find him at our deepest, profoundest place of trauma. God is there. And sometimes you think, well, but there must be exceptions to that. What about? And, and I can only speak for myself, but I can speak from the stories of others that in the darkest, most horrible places, where's God? Jesus is weeping with us when we weep. He knows the future. He knows how life works out. He knows the resurrection. You know, we see in part, he sees it all. So when he weeps, he's weeping with us, not for us, if that makes sense. I find that so profound, profoundly helpful, profoundly comforting that Jesus, God himself, is moved with us. And then comes the moment when the stone is rolled away. And this is just so fun. But Lord, said Martha, this is Martha, the, 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 uh, by this time there is a bad odour, for he has been there four days. The King James Version puts it much better. He stinketh. <laughs> I love that. He stinketh. In other words... He really, this is not a good idea, Jesus. In the realm of good ideas, this is not one of them. And Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you'll see the glory of God? I still don't think they have any idea what's coming. 
I mean, I can't imagine what they're thinking. And so they roll the stone away. And Jesus prays, really simply, would everyone here get this and see what this is for? And then he shouts, as Val did so brilliantly, and I won't imitate her, Lazarus, come out. I'll just cough if I shout. Lazarus, come out. And then this kind of man walks out with the grave clothes wrapped round, and everyone's thinking, we are in an episode of The Waking Dead. It's sort of, you know, what's this? He's wrapped in stinky, dirty grave clothes. And out he comes. What, a, what an incredible picture. And, and then Jesus simply goes, get those clothes off him, let him go. Like, we're done now. I was thinking, what? It's like the most remarkable thing ever, but it's not for Jesus. This is what's so profound. It's, do you know, that each day, one day, sorry, one day, it's going to be a knock at my tomb. And Jesus is going to say, Chris, out you come. It's going to be a knock at your tomb. And he's going to say, Jesus, Jesus is going to say, out you come. Because we believe in resurrection. And heaven is not a place we go to when we die. We go to be with Jesus, wherever that might be. But one day, we don't stay there. We're just as he rose from the dead, so we will rise from the dead. That's what the New Testament talks about. Paul talks about, well, some of you Christians have fallen asleep, and one day you're going to wake up. Because that's what death is to a Christian. So we just close our eyes, we fall asleep, and then one day, we're going to knock on the tomb. Chris, out you come. Take off the grave clothes. You've got a new body. Everything's new. I'm here. And the whole of creation will be made new. Heaven will be on earth. This is the future hope of us as Christians. John is saying, and Jesus says, you know, I'm the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me will live even though they die. You know, I know that the two things in life are guaranteed, are death and taxes. Um, I don't know who said that, but it's true. Well, maybe it's not the taxes thing isn't true. Some people can work that out. But, you know, death is a reality. It's a reality for all of us. We either face it ourselves or we've been through it with others. But also, the, the Jesus says, but that reality is transcended by a greater reality, which is Lazarus, come out. An end to death, to suffering, to sickness. Every tear caught and wiped away from our eyes. That's the future hope of the kingdom that we have. Lazarus, come out. Chris, come out out what a profound hope we have in Christ if we die in him we'll rise with him you know when we baptize we've got four baptisms next week I'm so excited it's not the best service ever Easter day and baptisms my kind of sugar level and excitement level goes off the scale at that service I won't let any of the team near any of it it's all me I love doing them Um, actually I'm not speaking next week in the evening thank goodness but I will be doing the baptisms and we get in the water and we, 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 we look at them and ask them the same question that Jesus asked Martha. I, well, the question I ask is, is this your faith? Do you believe this? And if they say yes, then we plunge them under the water. They die with Christ. They leave all of their stuff, the sin and everything else at the bottom of the pool. And we pull them up because they are resurrected. Lazarus come out. It's a new life. I knew I'd speak for too long. I get really excited about this passage. Forgive me. Let's just come into some stuff for us to think about from the story. Um, firstly, coming back to Jesus. What, is, what does this sign say about Jesus? Well, it says this, number one, he has power and authority over death. Sometimes we sing songs that talk about where, oh, death is your sting. And I often think, well, I mean, stings. You might say something stronger than that at times. But it stings. But do you know, that sting isn't permanent for us who follow Jesus. That at the end of the day, when that time comes, death will feel like a distant memory. I can't imagine how that feels and what that looks like. But that's the promise of Christian hope. As we trust in Christ, he's making all things new. That Jesus has power and authority over death. And by believing in him, and and belief again in John's gospel, it's it's that wholehearted kind of, okay, Jesus, I'm going to walk with you, live for you. 
seek you first. We don't get it all right. We don't have to start kind of full on. We might just take a toe in the water, but we at least make a journey in that direction. We, we immerse ourselves, as it were, into Jesus. And as we do that, we enter eternal life. Eternity starts now. So death is just simply a blip on the journey of eternity. The thing is, I think, well, I know, is that we'll look back at it and see it as a blip. But whilst we're in this life, it feels a little bit bigger than that. But we will look back. That's the job of the preacher, is to, is to try and make that come to life. Imagine looking back and think, well, yeah, I died once, but I'm alive now. I'm risen. I'm resurrected. And, and Jesus is the only one who can do it. And the second thing is this, is that Jesus is the comforter in our grief. Look how he is with Mary. With Martha, he points to the resurrection from the dead, that future hope. And with Mary, what does he do? He's moved from the stomach, the deepest part of himself, and he weeps with her. And we're going to be a church that doesn't always get it right. But we are always going to be a church that seeks healing and miracles, the resurrections, that all of that stuff. We're going to pray for it and pray for it and pray some more and keep on praying. We're not going to see things as lost causes. We're going to keep going for it. But if we only do that and we don't do what Jesus did, which is to get alongside those for who, who, who if only you've been here, God. If only you've been here, Jesus. Why couldn't you do something? And we just sit there and weep with those who weep. That's what, that's what we're going to do because that's the ministry of Jesus. He does both. He does both in this moment. Even though he knows that Lazarus will rise, He still comforts those who mourn. Isn't that a beautiful picture of who Jesus is? And so we'll be a people who do that. Because miracles and mercy always go together. And then what about us? Oh, I find quite emotional. Let me have a drink of water. I think some of you wondered, just for a second then... Now you're really wondering, what about us? Two things. Jesus looking at us. Do you believe this? Do you believe it? I I have good days and bad days. Isn't that true about faith? It ain't one straight line. Some days we're full of faith. Other days we wrestle with faith. But all the time, Jesus is consistent. Just saying to us, do you believe it? In other words, what he's saying is, will you trust me? Will you put your hand in mine? Even though I walk through the shadow of the valley of, valley of, the shadow of death, <laughs> I'll fear no evil. Why? Because you're with me. So I put my hand in your hand and let's walk through the valley. And if walking through the valley means that you come through to the other side. Do you believe this? There's that challenge to us. Can we reply like Martha, like Thomas, like Nicodemus, all of these characters, the woman at the well? Do we believe this? Will we put our trust once again in Jesus? And the final thing is Jesus' cry at the tomb. Lazarus, come out. Now, this is where I get a little bit geeky, but I think there's something in this. Lazarus is in the tomb for four days. Palm Sunday, Um, the crowds are crying, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The palm branches are down. The the Messiah is here. And in their minds, the Romans will be gone and we'll have this kingdom again, like the kingdom of David and everything else. And, And then we have Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. We have four days where actually the crowds turn away from Jesus. And not all of them. But the whole city cries, Hosanna. And then a big crowd cries, we want Barabbas, crucify Jesus. And I just wonder, actually Jesus making the point again, is is that part of the Christian life is we just hold on. We keep shouting Hosanna even when our circumstances seem to change. Even when Jesus isn't the flavour of the month. Even when it's hard to be a Christian. We're having to make decisions that seem contrary to our workplace, our family and, you know, one of the things hopefully this summer I'm going to do is spend some time with a pastor and his, 
uh, and, and, and their family who are from northern Nigeria. And if you know anything from Open Doors and others, it's probably one of the most dangerous places in the world to be a Christian at the moment. And they're on furlough. They're having a break. And, and I just want to sit and listen to them and learn how to pray from them because, boy, do they know how to pray much better than I do. And sometimes it's hard to be a Christian, I mean, really hard, but actually they're still trusting in Jesus because they believe in the resurrection. Um, and so Lazarus come out. might be for us, it's like, do you know what? I used to be in that kind of Hosanna. And I'm, I'm guessing that none of us are in the crucify him kind of stage. But, you know, we just might not be shouting it anymore. It might be that kind of our hearts feel a bit more like, kind of, to be honest, I'm tired. Life has taken it out of me a bit. I've lost some of that passion. Sometimes we go, well, it's because I was young and I was naive. And, you know, you, everyone's enthusiastic when they're young. And, 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 and I sometimes fall into that old man trap of doing that. And it's, it's just not true. It's that people who love Jesus and keep loving him keep that life. And maybe we want it back. Because Holy Week, we'll come back to the start. This week is the week to do it. It's to, it's to ask Jesus for resurrection in our lives again. You know, maybe it's this week that we begin to shout once again, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah anyway. The greatest thing that I practice um, through the midst of suffering and disappointment is worship. It's the one thing that keeps God big in my life. And I won't ever stop. For some of us, we just need Jesus to come alongside us and comfort us. We need him to weep with us or to be reminded that in the darkest, most traumatic moment, he is alongside us as close as our breath. Because as he does that, we'll see him glorified in the, and, and we'll see good come from suffering. The great Christian apologetic to suffering isn't that we can explain it, but it's that we can show that suffering isn't meaningless, that there's always someone else who has the final say, that death isn't the end because Jesus has defeated it, that our sickness and our suffering and our disappointment doesn't define us, Jesus does. And that's a gift to our world who basically, if, if, you're, if you don't believe in God, suffering is just random, irrelevant, meaningless. If you believe certain things about God, that God, everything is God's will, therefore God's just chosen that you should suffer. That's it. We don't believe that. We hold this tension of we believe in a God who's all-powerful and all-loving, and we live in a broken world where we experience brokenness as much as anyone else. So we wrestle with where God is in the midst of it. But we're reminded God is in the midst of it. God never leaves us from the, that place. God walks with us in every part and will be glorified through it that my suffering, my little bit, God can bring for good for others. And that, makes something, that makes suffering feel different. hope that's all right. I've got all emotional, which I shouldn't have done, but this passage is profound as we start Holy Week. So I want to say this week, this week, friends, carve out space to be with Jesus. We're not doing 24-7 prayer this week. It's not going to stop any, any of you, if you'd like to, to get up at two in the morning and pray for a couple of hours. But nor do you need to feel a compulsion to do that. But carve out some time. Come to our services. The reason we're doing them is so that we as a family can journey together. Maundy Thursday of communion. On Good Friday, yeah, we're not doing what we've done before, which is that three-hour service at the cross. But this year... We're going to do something different where we journey to the cross in a different way. Uh, we journey to the cross with a smile on our face because we know what's coming. We invite the children to celebrate and the whole family of the church to celebrate on Good Friday because we know what's coming. And then Easter Sunday morning, we just let rip and we're going to have lots of fun celebrating Jesus. And then Easter Sunday evening will be even better because we'll have baptisms. And that's where we're going this week. Join us for all of those services. Journey with us carve out time to pray. I will definitely do some early mornings because I love them where I can just sit and be still before God. Been some, some of my most profound times with God have been in Holy Week. So I want to invite you into that this week as we do it. I'm going to come into land and I'd love us to pray. So why don't we stand?
picture in my mind of um, of a candle, and I don't know much about candles, but sometimes when you have a big candle and you just leave the flame lit, it just burns down the middle. And the candle's still lit, but you can't see it. And, and I think for some of us, that's how we feel about life. The candle's still lit, you just can't really see it. It doesn't really impact me at the moment. You know, marriage is hard. Parenting is difficult. Work is a struggle. Unanswered prayer. Just feel a bit kind of meh about stuff. The candle's still lit, you just can't see it. And I think what God wants to do is, someone correct me, is it trimming the candle? Is that what we call it? Is it? You promise? Okay. You take the outer side off and let that light shine. And I think how we do that is we just ask God to do it for us, to help us, to reignite our faith in him and trust in him, to remind us of his goodness to us. So I'd love us to pray, just to close our eyes and just to wait on God for a moment. And Father, I pray for us, pour out your spirit upon your people right now. Come Holy Spirit. From the youngest to the oldest here today, pour out your spirit. Bring life. Bring life. Let's just pause for a moment. I want to just ask us a couple of things. One, do you believe this? And to believe is faith. It's to say, I don't have all the answers. I don't feel certain, but I'm going to trust. If you just need to take that step of trust today, just put your hand in the hand of Jesus. I'm going to invite you to come forward in a moment. And the next is this, is I think that Jesus is calling some of us out. Come out. Come back to life. Come back to life in me. Come back to life in your parenting, in your marriage, in your workplace. Come back to life. Yeah, you might have taken a beating. You might look like you've been in the grave four days, but come back to life. And Jesus is calling your name. He's saying, come. So if that's you, on either of those, why don't you come to the front? It could be all of us. I could be there. No problem. But come to the front now. Before we worship, we're going to pray over you. Ali, is there anything you want to say? Yeah, just, I had that um, sense of, in the story, Jesus asked, doesn't he? He asked where the body has been laid. And uh, the disciples say, the people say to him, Lord, come and see. And, and Jesus must have known where the body was laid. But actually, he wants to share our pain. He wants us to invite him into that. He wants us to, to invite him in. He wants us to show him, even though he knows. And I just wondered for some of us whether we might want to say, come and see, Lord. Come and come and meet me in my pain afresh. Yeah, so come, come on forward now, if that's you. Before we worship, just make your way to the front. Lovely. Don't be shy. It's Easter week, Holy Week. Easter week's the week after. It's Holy Week. We need him. He's here for us. Come if you're grieving. Come if you're hungry. Come if you're broken. Come if you've failed. Just come. Yeah, that's it. If there are folk who could come and pray and stand alongside my friends who come forward, that would be brilliant. So we're going to worship. 
sing a couple of songs. If you've, if you'd rather not come up now, but want to come up in a minute, whenever you want, we're here to pray. So, Father, let the Spirit fall upon your people, come Holy Spirit, right now. Pray for resurrection life. Come out, come out of that grave. Be filled again with the Spirit. Just bless you, Lord. Bless you, Lord. Amen. Amen. If there are a few more folks, come and pray. That would be great. And others, if you want to make your way forward, please feel free to do so. Let us 
going on in our lives that we can just lift our eyes up and that you are there. Help us keep our eyes fixed on you, Lord. Amen. As we draw our service to a close, just a reminder that if you're new, we'd love to get to know you. So please do come say hi afterwards at the welcome desk. And we do have contactless giving as well as a basket there if that's part of your regular worship. And then the last thing is that we do have Palm Sunday crosses. Um, at the back, so please do collect one as we get into, into Holy Week. And it's like great. Uh, Father, we thank you that you meet us in our pain. We thank you that you draw near to the brokenhearted. And Lord, as we leave this place today, as we enter Holy Week, Lord, may we know you walking closely with us. And Lord, we thank you for all the blessings that you pour out on us. And Lord, as we go out into our community, may we be a blessing to those around us. In your name. Amen. Hope to see you next week. Thanks. It's a new horizon, and I'm set on.